So struts are one of the most common things you will use in Golang and understanding them is a real must. But mastering everything, including embedded structs, pointers or tags can be really challenging, especially for beginners. That's why I've decided to make this video your last video about structs in Golang. I'll try to cover everything you need to know about structs. Oh, and by the way, if you're new here, my name is Flo, I'm a professional software engineer, and on this channel we do everything related to the world of software engineering. So the main idea of structs in general is to just group related data together in one data type so that you only have one single thing that is basically a collection of fields. So for example, if you have an employee database, you do not want to specifically store every single field in an array and then index them just to get some information of a specific employee, right? You want some sort of encapsulation so that you have just one employee with the correct data in it so that you can easily access, for instance, the first name and the last name of an employee without really some weird magic indexing structure in an array. Okay, so let's quickly get into the code here. So let's first look at how you can actually define a struct in Golang. So first we will use the type keyword here. Now this type keyword in Golang generally means that you want to create a new name type. After that type keyword, we just specify the name of the struct. Now here it is important if you start with a lowercase letter or uppercase letter. So lowercase basically means that it is private in your module and then this struct cannot be used outside of this module for instance. But if you start with an uppercase letter, obviously this struct will be public. So let's just make it public for now. And then we use struct here to say that this name type is a struct. And then in here we can basically define our fields. So for instance, an employee could have the name which could be a string, an age which could be an integer and maybe also a flag which signals if the employee works remote. Now here again it is important how you capitalize these variables. Again, lowercase means private, uppercase means public. Okay, so let's jump quickly to our main function and then let's just use this employee struct. So we can say, for instance, employee1 and then we create a new employee. Now we use the assignment operator here directly to just initialize this employee1 with our employee struct. Now in this curly braces, we can now define the data we want associated to this employee. So we can say name, which could be Alice, age could be 30 and is remote could be true. Now accessing these struct fields is also really simple because now we can just print, for instance, something to the console. And in here we can say employee name and then we just use employee1.name and same with the age. And this is how you can access the data in a specific struct. Now, I think this was pretty straightforward, hopefully, right? But a really cool thing that we can do in Go is to define anonymous structs. Now, the purpose of these anonymous structs is basically to just have a quick one-time solution or a quick one-time data type. Now, these anonymous structs allow encapsulation and flexibility and simplicity because you basically remove the overhead of defining a new struct inside your module and you just keep this struct inside a function, for instance. So let's create an anonymous struct here. Let's just say job and then we use the assignment operator and then we define the struct definition. So how the struct will look like. Now, it's important to note that we do not name this struct because obviously it is anonymous and cannot be reused and therefore we do not need a new name. Now in here we just say title and let's say salary can be an integer. Now obviously salary could be a float 64 for instance, but let's just keep this example really simple. Now after the struct definition, we can directly initialize or we have to initialize this struct by just using curly brackets again. And then we say title, which could be software engineer and salary which could be, for instance, 100K. Now, obviously, again, we can just access the fields by using the dot notation here. And that's how you can define an anonymous struct. Now, these anonymous structs are really helpful if you just want to encapsulate your data used inside a function, for instance. Okay, so let's look at a more scary thing, which are pointers. Now, I'll make a separate video about Golang pointers specifically, because that deserves 
its own video. But you need pointers whenever you want to mutate fields of a struct inside of a struct's function, for instance. Or you do want to mutate fields of a copied reference. So let me quickly show you what that means. Now, for instance, let's say we have an employee pointer, which just is assigned to the reference of our employee. And then we want to mutate this employee pointer data. So for instance, we want to say age is 31. Now, what this basically means here is that employee pointer does not have its own value. It just points to a reference of something. In this case, it is our struct employee one. And whenever we do mutate the fields of this employee pointer, it directly mutates the fields of this struct. So it's here not really passed by value. So we do not copy the value we pass by reference. Okay, let's just make this thing a bit more clearer by just defining some functions for our employee struct. Now, let's just say that we want to, for instance, mutate the name and age of our employee struct. Now, I will create a wrong example and then I will create the actual correct example. So let's just start with the wrong function here. So let's create a function which we call update name. Now, and in this update name function, we expect a new name, which could be a string. And then we want to assign the name of an employee to this new name. Now, generally for structs, we can define these struct functions, these functions that will only be callable whenever we use the dot notation of a struct. We can define these by just using the round brackets here before the function name. And then we have to define here the struct, which is in this case employee. And we name this identifier to the struct E because obviously we want to access the fields inside of this employee. So we say e.name is equal to new name. Now beginners would say that do not have a broad understanding of pointers. They would say that this function works, right? We just call the function of an employee update name. Then we pass in a new name and then it should update the field. Let's just quickly do this by simply calling the update name function here. And let's just say we use Bob. Now this is how you can call the function of a struct. And like I said before, we associated this function with the struct by just using the identifier or the annotation we had before the function name. Now if we run this program, things might look really interesting, right? Because we've updated the name to be Bob, but it's still Alice. Now why is that? And that's where pointers come in handy. Because what we said with this definition here is that we want to have a function which is called update name. However, we don't pass the struct here by reference, we only pass it by value. Now that really means that it does not really have the understanding where this employee struct is currently in the memory. It only understands the values of this struct. That really means that whenever we say e.name is equal to new name, then it only updates the local employee of this function. So for instance, if we just print the name here, this will work, right? E.name is the new name. But because we copied kind of the struct into this function again through not using a pointer, it does not update the actual employee struct. Now, this is really important to note here. Now, how we can fix this issue? We just use a pointer before that. And if we run this again, things will work now. Now again, why does this work? We do not pass by value in this case, we pass by reference. So we do not copy the whole struct by value, we just use this pointer to point to this reference in memory and then update the employee memory. Now hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Now generally copying things, especially structs that are larger, can be really inefficient in terms of memory. That's why I recommend when using larger structs that are really enormous to just use a pointer because you do not copy the value here, you just use the reference. However, it's also important to not always use the asterisk or the pointer because that indicates to the user of this function or to the developer of this function that the employee struct is modified in some way. And we obviously want to avoid this confusion. All right, this was pretty cool. Let's quickly look at the more advanced things with structs in Golang. Now let's just first look at nested structs here, which basically means that you can have structs inside of structs. 
Now this allows further encapsulation and is called composition. Now composition and inheritance is not the same, this is really important to note, and I will create a custom video about these two things. So let's quickly look at composition in Golang. Now let's just say that we define a new struct, which can be the address. And in this address, we do have a street, but we also do have the city, for instance, which could also be a string. Now it's kind of obvious that every employee has also somehow an address, right? So what we could do is just use composition or these embedded structs to have the functionality of the address struct inside of the employee struct. So what we could do here to enable this composition is to just define address. Now let's just use this address in our main function. Let's just define a new address and we use address here. And then we define the street, which could be one, two, three, and then main street. And the city for instance is New York. Then when we define the employee and initialize it, we just say address is equal to our address that we've defined previously. And now what we could do is access these fields of the address inside of our employee. Now, for instance, we can print the whole address here by just using employee one dot, and then we use street directly without accessing the address struct. And then we use employee one dot city. And this here works because we now use composition. Now, if we run this, obviously it will work, but now let's just create a function for our address. So let's say we have a function which we call print address. And obviously this function is associated to our address struct. And in here, we just print the address. And then in our main function, we can make use of this print address function by just saying employee one dot print address. Now this is pretty cool, right? Because now we have the function, which is kind of inside of our address, but we can access it through composition in our employee struct, which is really handy if you want to encapsulate your data or kind of combine your structs in any way. Now another advanced feature of structs are so called tags. Now these tags allow you to convey some sort of metadata of this specific field of a struct. And obviously you can create your own tags. I will do this also in a separate video, but this would be too advanced. And commonly known use cases for these tags are for instance data validation or serialization to for instance JSON or XML. Now let's just say that we build our HTTP server or a simple web server around this functionality and around our structs. And now I do want to, for instance, respawns with the employee struct. Now to serialize this data inside of a struct, we can just use the JSON tag. Now for that, we use these backticks here, and then we say JSON, and then we define the name of the field which should be displayed in the JSON response, for instance. Now this specific JSON name will be used as the key for the key value pairs in the JSON object. So let's just say name here, keep it simple. And now the Go compiler actually complains that this name has to be public. So we will make it public by just using an uppercase N. Let's do the same thing with our H, but also with our is remote flag. Now it is pretty clear that you can use anything you want as the key name for your JSON object. So you could say instead of is remote as the name, you could just use remote, for instance. Let's just make these two struct fields public as well. And then we want to have the same functionality, the same JSON tags in our address as well. So let's just say here JSON and then street. And for the city, we obviously use city as well. And now we need to fix the smaller issue with the update name function, but also the initialization of our employee here. All right, let's just demonstrate this example by using the json.marshall function to kind of serialize the data to a JSON object. So for that, we just say JSON data, then we don't care about the error. Obviously you should always handle your errors. So I do not recommend this here. Then we use the assignment operator and then we use the marshall function of the encoding slash JSON package. And in here, we just define the employee one value. Now let's just print our JSON data here. And to demonstrate actually the use case of these tag names here, of the JSON names, let's just say that the city is called 
my city and street is called my street. Now what this json.marshall now actually does is kind of serializing the employee one data or the employee one struct based on the defined tags for the struct. So if you run this program now, we actually see the bytes representation of our JSON data. Now to just say that we want a string of our JSON data, we can say string and this will cast these bytes to a string so that we can actually understand the data here. Now let's just run the program again. And now we can see this serialized struct. So we have the name, age is remote, and then we have my street and my city. And this is the real power of using tags in Golang. Hopefully you did understand everything I talked about here, especially the more complex stuff like embedded structs or tags. And another powerful thing in Golang are interfaces. And these Golang interfaces can be implemented by structs. Now this enables polymorphism and a lot of flexibility in your code. So feel free to check out this video here whenever it comes out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.